Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, what would a webinar be without some tech issues? But here we are. Um, welcome to this Daily Maverick um, webinar on the 59th uh, United States presidential election. My name is Judith February, and I'll be chairing this, um, what I'm sure will be a really interesting conversation. And I'd like to welcome this morning um, the Daily Maverick Associate Editor, Brooke Spector, and the Economist Corporate Network Director for Africa, Herman Warren. We'll both of them have um, are seasoned in, in matters of American politics. And um, we look forward, as I said, to a fascinating conversation. We'll also be taking some of your um, comments in the chat box. So um, please look out um, for that. Um, ahead of this, uh, this webinar, the Daily Maverick ran a poll around, um, around issues of, um, with, with all of you as, as readers, talking about um, the understanding of the mechanics of the American elections process. 53% of you in the poll said you totally get it, you totally understand the mechanics. 60% of you said you were a bit confused, but you understood the basics. And 7% of you um, said no idea. So I think to start off, um, we've had, I'm sure those of you who are political junkies like me, um, you would have been watching what's been happening in America and um, with the Democratic National Convention first, and now the Republican National Convention, which is still happening. And we would have seen the contrast there between light and dark and very different visions of America on display. But I thought we'd start off with um, Brooks, um, just to go to you, just to tr to give us in a nutshell the um, a sort of one minute synopsis on how the system works. How is it possible that Hillary Clinton um, won the popular vote by three million or so, and yet that electoral college um, and she, you know, steps in and she loses the election. So could you perhaps just give us the idiot's guide um, to, to your country's election, please? Okay, well, we'll do it this way. I will, we'll take the entire semester course and we'll shrink it down <laughs> to, to one minute. Uh, I'll talk really fast. Um, the, you start with the idea that the election for president in the United States is not a straightforward popular vote contest. If it were, uh, Hillary Clinton would be running for re-election right now. But as you say, she won the popular vote, three million or so votes uh, ahead of her arrival, but uh, Donald Trump became the president. Uh, the constitutional arrangements, the compromise that was put together in 1787 and largely still holds, uh, makes it a vote that takes place effectively in 50 separate states and the District of Columbia, so that if you win, say, for the sake of argument, the state of California by two votes, uh, you get the full electoral weight of California. Now, electoral weight is very simply the number of congressional members, members of the House of Representatives, plus the Senate. So in California's case, out of the, t the national total of 400 and 38 uh, electoral votes. Uh, California has some 55 of them, which makes it the largest single delegation. So if you win California, even by just those mythic two votes, you get what amounts to 12 or 13 percent of the entire electoral weight that's up for grabs. You need a total of 270 out of those 438. That's, um, that's a, a bare majority. Keep in mind also that uh, at any at, at any presidential election, it isn't just the president and vice president that are up for election or re-election. It's a third of the Senate, the entire House of Representatives, and depending on what you read, uh, because it depend, depends a little bit how it's counted, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80,000 other offices from state, local, county, municipal, offices from governorships all the way down to uh, food safety inspectors in a few states. Um, but also keep in mind in this case that the two presidential candidates, uh, the one is obviously the incumbent and now is simply going through uh, a re-election process, but uh, Joe Biden won his nomination by winning uh, a majority of the delegates 
for the Democratic National Convention through all of the primaries, the, all those elections that began at the beginning of the year and it ran up through a few weeks ago, actually. Um, many of them increasingly done uh, virtually or by uh, by mail-in ballots with the, uh, the attending confusion and chaos that came out of that. Uh, so here we are now, we're 68 days until the election. And the one footnote in all that, uh, keep in mind, is that there will be a much larger than previously number of mail-in or absentee ballots. And some people estimate it'll be about 70 million. 70 million wow. absentee ballots will be counted before, will be cast rather, before mm -hmm. election day, only mm -hmm. counted on election day or uh, hopefully on election day. But no one knows how that's going to work out because it's never been done that way before. Now, absent all of that ballots, but this is the first time around a vast number of people can vote that way. Judith, is that one minute and a little bit? Um, it's, it's, it's one minute and a little bit, Brooks, but actually you, um, we will be talking about um, the mail-in ballots um, later and also issues of, of voter suppression. Um, and so, um, Herman, I don't know if you'd like to perhaps add to that, but uh, and then I'm going to put the question to you then. Given what Brooks has just said around mm -hmm. the Electoral College and the eccentricities of it, really, and I know there's a debate around um, issues of, you know, how to change that, but um, it is, it, to quote Michelle Obama, it is what it is. Um, and mm -hmm. so, uh, Herman, I want to um, turn to you to ask, um, what then is the pathway for victory, both for Joe Biden and for Donald Trump? If you look at um, the difference between the RNC and, and the DNC, I mean, on the one hand, it was for the Democrats, character was on the ballot. Um, it mm. was uh, trying to draw this contrast between Biden and uh, and Trump, and also mm. the Democrats going hard on issues of the strains of authoritarianism and and we'll talk later about Barack Obama's um, speech on that. And then the Republican view of a land of opportunity, but that's quickly gone uh, dystopian again um, into they are going to be coming into your suburbs. I mean, there's a very real kind of racist undertone to, to quite a lot mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. And so yeah. clearly you can pick up from there where these candidates um you know, how they see very, a very different visions of America, but also be um, what they see as the pathway. So Herman, to you, what do you think um, is the pathway for, for both of these men, if you were advising them? Sure. Uh, on the first point with regard to the Electoral College, there are many um, arguments for and against. Uh, some would, would raise the point that uh, without the Electoral College, some of the, the smaller states wouldn't get attention. Um, some raise the point that it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's all about the swing states, uh, which, will, which we'll come to, which feeds into your question about the pathway for victory. Uh, many point out, however, that it, it dilutes democracy in a way. Um, Brooks brought up the, the, the point about uh, Hillary Clinton winning the most overall votes, but not in the right places. Um, and, and therefore losing by, by a quite significant margin in the Electoral College. Uh, if you look at um, California, which, which Brooks mentioned, uh, 55 Electoral College votes composed of uh, two senators and, uh, and 53, if my math is, my simple math is correct, uh, representatives in the House, in the House of Representatives. Uh, that equates to effectively one Electoral college vote for 718,000 residents of California. Now, a state that's not too far away from California on the western side of the United States is Wyoming. They have three electoral college votes, but those three electoral college votes correlate to 192,000 residents of Wyoming. So the weight of the, the, the Wyoming vote is much heavier uh, three times plus as much as the weight uh, from an electoral college perspective uh, of a Californian's uh, vote. Mm. This is all going to come down to the swing states. 
And, and that's what caused Hillary Clinton to lose the election uh, in 2016. And by the way, um, that wasn't the first time that we had a situation in, in the most recent history where uh, a minority of, of the, the collective vote elected a president. Uh, two out of the last five uh, ended in that situation. Uh, 2000, uh, between Bush and Gore. Uh, and then and then 2016 between Hillary Rodden Clinton and and Donald J. Trump. But what Trump was able to do uh, in 2016 was to swing states, key states to the he made those states red. Uh, Pennsylvania would be in that mix, a state that hadn't been a Republican state in nearly 30 years. Wisconsin would fall into that category. Michigan would fall in would fall into that category. So those are going to be the areas of, of, of key contention. At The Economist, we have a daily model that predicts uh, the outcome uh, of an election. Uh, to, to Brooke's point, we're around 70 days away from an election, and that can be a lifetime in, in, the, in, 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 the political, in the political sense. If you just think about how much has changed uh, over the course uh, of this year, uh, no one thought we'd, we'd be where we are at this current moment. But, but based on the model, and the polling uh, that we're, we're doing and, and watching, uh, Joe Biden is set for um, a significant and very clear, um, a very clear win. And that's by winning in those battleground states. So he's leading in Pennsylvania. He's likely to win Michigan. He's likely to win uh, Wisconsin. Uh, states that have traditionally been red, or at least have been red in the last uh, in the last election, Florida uh, is looking looking very strong on the on the Biden side, uh, as well as Texas, which I think for me is one of the most interesting uh, states, mm -hmm. given how red that state typically has swung. With mm -hmm. regard to the environment, it's extremely polarized and extremely poisoned. Both sides view the election as existential. If you listen to the Republicans, certainly over the first day, um, Biden and Kamala Harris want to create a socialist utopia. Uh, they're going to open up the borders. They're going to increase taxes. Law and order is going to break down. It's going to be Venezuela. Uh, if you listen to Trump pre, uh, pre the convention, the only way he loses is if it's rigged. And it goes to that point that, uh, that Brooks was, was, was uh, alluding to about the mail, the mail in ballots and potentially 70 million of those. Uh, uh, being uh, being brought into play, but but the United States is set for a, a future like Venezuela if Biden wins. Um, you quoted, "It is what it is." Uh, that was Michelle Obama quoting Donald, Donald Trump. Trump. When, yes, uh, when he was uh, faced with the, you know the statistics of how many Americans had died at that stage, and, and the number unfortunately is much higher than it was at that time, and will be much higher by the time we get to November November third. Uh, but they're 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 painting a picture of. Again, it's existential. This is the most important election of our lifetime with significant crises of uh, health care, clearly, economic, uh, climate, uh, social disorder on a scale that, 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 that many people have, have, have never seen or, or, don't, or don't remember. So they're about bringing back a steady hand uh, to the White House and getting things back on track with empathy, bridge building, being able to reach across the aisle. Uh, I know we're going to talk about foreign policy and other areas mm -hmm. later, but Trump is running on the economy, which isn't necessarily as, as high on the, on the starred list as it was pre-COVID, pre really taking, taking, taking a bite um, out, of that, out of that narrative, and also uh, on, on law, law and order. And, uh, and, 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 and Biden is on the side of, you know, I'm part of the establishment uh, which has been rejected in the last couple of couple of elections, but this is what we need right now. And it seems like that message is resonating a bit more if you look at the polling um, than what Trump has been able to to lay out. Thanks. Um, and Brooks, I'm going to put the same question to you, but perhaps, um, Herman, the interesting points around Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. And I mean, people in, in 2016 were berating Hillary Clinton for not spending enough time um, in, in places like Wisconsin and, and Michigan. But um, Brooks, I, I want to move that question to you, but also just to comment on the, the so even within those swing states, it seems to me as if you are, one has to focus on if, if Biden wants to win, and I, I hear everything about the polls, 
but on particular segments of voters, you know, is it, um, you know, uh, suburban housewife, uh, suburban women um, or college educated whites, et cetera, um, you know, who it, it seems to be that the selection is going to be like a pinpoint. And so I'm going to put that over to you and also to talk about Texas. I, Herman, I found your comments on Texas really interesting. Um, and Arizona seems to me to mm. also um, be um, in play here. Brooks? Mm. Yeah, one of the things that because of what Herman just said about the existential nature of the election, uh, it's really rather hard at this point to find somebody who is undecided. Uh, mm. th there are mm. probably uh, optimistically, uh, from what I have read and listened to, there are probably 7% of the registered electorate who still has not, quote unquote, made up his, her mind. Um, now, hmm. we sometimes tend to think of these people as independent voters, people who are carefully studying the platform and the candidate's history and their biography and their proposals. But really, most independent voters um, at this point are what we call low information voters, people who haven't made up their minds, primarily because they've given very little thought to the question and don't have in front of them yet much information to make a judgment on. Uh, in the last election, uh, that difference in the three states you mentioned, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, worked out to about the same number of people who would fit into Ellis Park Stadium, plus a few standing on the field. Uh, that is, when you think about a country the size of the United States, it boiled down to uh, a couple of bridge games worth of people per voting precinct in those three states, which is extraordinary. To the list of swing states, I would add two more that are crucial. Ohio, which has historically in the last 30 years or so been seen as increasingly Republican, and Florida, which is now uh, pretty much a toss-up because of the complicated demography of Florida. And that gets back to your question, Judith. Uh, people who study this stuff are busy dicing and slicing the electorate, both in terms of gender, uh, race, uh, ethnicity, which is not quite the same as race, uh, mm -hmm. economic circumstances, and college education, or the lack of it, as well mm -hmm. as income. Now, 50 years ago, certainly, if you had told me the salient details of a person, I could have predicted with about 99% degree of accuracy who they would vote for, because those, uh, those voting patterns had been ingrained largely since the time of the Great Depression, and Franklin Roosevelt's grand democratic coalition. You could you could almost you could almost make make a bet on it and be right, become very rich. But it's now become much more complicated because people are in the process of shifting their old allegiances and alliances to newer versions of things. And in particular, as you alluded to, um, white middle class college-educated suburban-dwelling women have now slid away from the Republicans rather decisively over the last three elections and are now seen largely as a democratic preserve, partly because the nature of suburbia has changed, partly because it is a much better educated cohort of people, and partly because the issues themselves have become different for such people. Um, as a result, you go to some place like Florida, and there are, by most characterizations, five states within Florida. There is what sometimes unflatteringly is referred to as the redneck north, uh, that is people who would have been Democrats 100 years ago, but have been Republicans really since Barry Goldwater's time. Uh, mm. You have the Latino community in South Florida, which is divided between people who are Cuban American and who tend to have Republican sympathies dating back to Castro's takeover of Cuba, mm -hmm. and all the other Hispanic speaking communities in Florida, Puerto Ricans or Dominicans uh, mm -hmm. or others who tend to vote on economic issues and therefore line up with Democrats. You have a large retired cohort, which is significantly, but not decisively, uh, 
urban Jewish New York based Pennsylvania based uh, who have heretofore been rigorously democratic in their voting patterns. You have African Americans who have been largely Democrat voting. Um, how many? Uh, that's five constituencies, right? And to win in Florida uh, means you have to somehow figure out the demographic geography such that you can win the majority of the votes in that state without sufficiently irritating everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and Ohio has something of the same kind of problem because it borders on uh, the Appalachian Mountains. There are a large cohort of people who come from uh, southern states. Uh, there is a large African-American community. Um, it used to be very strong union, unionized state, but uh, industry has, has, uh, has decreased. And so the union, therefore, old line Democrats have, have, have fallen away, but it is now in play yet again because of uh, younger people. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, old line Democrats, and now a question that goes to something that I think, Herman, you were talking about. No, no sorry, Judith, you were talking about this question of the, um, the chaos in the streets, the law and order issue may or may not resonate with people in those three states in particular, uh, mm. depending on how it's been phrased and whether or not the way in which things carry out on that front, the what I refer, refer to sort of un, uneasily as racial turmoil uh, between now and election day. Uh, yeah. Let me just add one other quick, quick thing. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't know what's going to happen because there are things like the possibility of a major mistake by one or the other candidate between now and election day. Mm -hmm. There are three presidential debates in which somebody will either shine or they'll both melt down or who knows what, and a vice presidential debate in which it is entirely unclear how that will come out. All these things may or may not affect voter turnout and voter expectations and ultimately voter decisions. Indeed, Brooks. And um, you know, I just just talking about um, going ahead to looking at the issue of, of race, because it's um, so uh, this morning on um, CNN, they had the results of uh, yet another poll, which talked about, um, you know, the three things that um, the, the two top issues for Republican voters were the economy, a crime and safety, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it struck me that um, very interesting. I mean, tr Trump's message seems to be, I'm running on an e a pre-COVID economy. It's almost, if you listen to everything, it's COVID-19 has been sanitized from the debate in a sense. And it, it struck me that at the same time as you're having what's happening in Kenosha, for example, and what's been happening mm -hmm. since the murder of George Floyd, that mm -hmm. um, for some people that is a very uncomfortable um, face of America. And clearly what um, the Republicans are trying to do is to paint that as the, the future under Biden is um, mm. looting and pillaging and all that sort of thing. Hence, the um, Biden came out quite quickly around issues of defunding the police. So my question is to you, Herman, and Brooks, you can come in, is around um, race and how um, the way in which both parties are really bringing it to the forefront. On the one hand, you know, trying to deal with some of the structural issues, although I think many might argue that the Democrats aren't there yet. And then the Republicans trying to, to use the fear-mongering tactics, which have worked in 2016. Um, and so, and I also hear what both of you are saying about the polls, but there are people who don't feel comfortable telling pollsters that they want to vote for Donald Trump. So how will race play, how will race play into, into this? And also then perhaps some thoughts on um, Kamala Harris's um, historic nomination. So to you, um, Herman. Sure. So uh, if you use the 2016 kind of uh, exit polls as a guide, and to a certain extent, let me just, I don't know if I added this uh, earlier, but Gallup has been keeping polls since the time FDR was in office. So kind of from the late, the late 30s. Uh, of all of their data, no one has had lower approval ratings than Donald Trump. 
Uh, the New York Times called uh, Donald Trump in one of their stories, uh, you know, the president of his people rather than the people. Because generally presidents try to reach across the, the divide, they, they bring people together, move more to the center. That, that hasn't been Trump's modus oper operandi. And white males in particular have been the bedrock of his support base, particularly white males without university qualifications. They have stuck by Donald Trump and he's still polling pretty high. I think there was a, a report that I read from earlier this month where he's got about 50% of the white male vote. However, those aren't the only votes he needs to count on. He needs to count on women voters and he's losing them. So the, he, he's kind of at about a 60, 40 uh, split at this stage, not in his favor, you know, by, in, in, Biden, in Biden's favor. So you can't just win on that white male cohort uh, that has that has stuck by him. Um, I was about to say to their credit, I'm not sure it's to their credit, but what the Republicans have been trying to do is to undermine Biden's credibility and also speak to minority communities, particularly black communities, and say, why are you continuing to put your trust in this Democratic Party? Right. So when it comes to Biden, he's been at the forefront over the last 50 years or so that he's been in public service and criminal justice reform, which hasn't worked in your favor. Um, so why trust him? As a matter of fact, uh, many of the speakers, including uh, I think the AG from yesterday, from Kentucky, who's a black man, uh, the senator, the, the only uh, black uh, Republican, Republican senator from South Carolina, Scott, uh, talking about you know, his vision of America, what it's done uh, for him, why he's optimistic, and why he's backing, backing Trump, and then highlighting things like investments that are going into uh, disadvantaged communities and, and, and areas, uh, and so on and so forth. I think one of Scott's line was, you know, you know I'm hopeful because my family went from, from picking cotton to Congress kind of within a, within a, within a generation. I, I'm not quite sure that message is going to be convincing. Um, I think that we are going to see the vast majority of, of women, of minorities, uh, African-Americans, uh, uh, Hispanics, and so on, swinging to the Democratic side. And this comes to Kamala Harris, Harris and why I think she was an inspired choice and an appropriate choice. Uh, she uh, has run uh, campaigns, so she's been through that fire. Um, there wasn't likely to be any skeletons tumbling out of the, out of the closet after she's been through through that process at, at a, a number of levels. She was district attorney of, uh, of San Francisco. She was the attorney general of California. Uh, of course, she's a senator. Uh, and she and she she launched a um, a presidential a presidential campaign. Um, she she clearly will resonate with the, the the future of the Democratic Party, which is a much more diverse coalition, if you will, than the Republican Party. A um, lot more moving parts, uh, and I think she'll be able to appeal to the progressives and not uh, scare away some of the more conservative elements uh, in in the Democratic in the Democratic uh, base, and hopefully energize people to come out to the polls because. Although Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, as we've mentioned a couple of times, uh, if you compare how many people came out to vote for her relative to Barack Obama, uh, they either switched their votes uh, to, to the side of Trump or they stayed home. Uh, she, I think she ran her last campaign event in Philadelphia yeah. uh, where Barack Obama uh, was there to, to speak on her behalf, and she pulled in less than 28,000 votes than he got in the 2012 election. That's almost as much as she lost the state by. I mean, it, so yeah. so I think with Kamala Harris, it's it's about thinking about uh, who's going to energize people to get out there and cast their votes, um, mm -hmm. either in person or by post, um, and and satisfy yeah. the, the the different kind of interest groups that exist uh, among the constituency. Yeah. So, um, Herman, that's great, Brooks. You might want to add to that, but I'm also looking at questions in the chat and um, quite a few questions around. Um, and it's a good point uh, where you ended, Herman, on mail-in voting. And just um, as Brooks, as you said, it's um, because of the pandemic, more people likely um, to vote and um, by mail. And you've got the president um, saying all kinds of things. You've got the 
postmaster general um, seeming to, uh, you know, want to stymie um, people from from voting. So um, if you could just comment on that and um, the, the, the effect that that might have. And then we've got a question here from um, Helmo Price who says, who asks, how long a delay do you expect between election day and the final results? And I think that, um, you know, given that there's going to be more to count. And I mean, I, you know, the one thing that um, David Axelrod was saying in one of his podcasts was, um, well, you know, what, the one word you won't hear coming out of Trump's mouth is the American people have spoken and that there will be an inevitable delay between the election day and counting of the votes and that that might give rise to um, a contested election. So your comments on that, um, Brooks. Okay, let me just first go back to what, what Herman was speaking of. The, the, some, of the, some of this election is going to swing in the minds of some people whether law and order as a construct is more important than economic distress and illness. Uh, and if those latter two are the ones that determine a person's perspective, that person votes Democratic. If law and order is the thing, then that's that begins to move the needle the other way. And I point to the 1988 election, Mike Dukakis mm. versus um, Bush. Herman Walker Bush, Bush mm. uh, the father of the other Bush. Uh, mm. At this time in the electoral cycle, Dukakis was decisively ahead. And the Bush campaign came up with an absolutely devastating advertisement, the Willie Horton ad. Mm -hmm. Willie Horton was a prisoner uh, for, uh, in Massachusetts who got a weekend furlough and then went uh, on a killing spree in the state of Maryland. Uh, and how he got there was another question. But uh, they used that. They didn't show a picture of Willie Horton. They simply showed a black silhouette with the words over the silhouette explaining where he had been and who had been the governor and what he had done once he had been out on a release program, leaving you as a voter to determine whether or not you wanted that future for your wife and children or not. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it switched the election. You could see it in the polling data. Uh, just the introduction of that ad was enough to tip the election the other way. Uh, it wasn't the election wasn't on economics. It wasn't on war and peace. It was on Willie Horton. Um, now to go back to um, mail-in ballots. It, it, sometimes we've been framing this question as if this is a new idea that suddenly came from the the brow of Zeus uh, and unbeknownst to anybody, suddenly infected the American political system. The truth of it is, and I went back and looked very carefully at this. Uh, Mail-in voting or absentee voting, they're effectively the same, regardless of the difference that Donald Trump mm. keeps trying to make about them. By the way, he, he votes absentee ballot, as does yeah. his wife, and as does his vice president and his wife. So right. <laughs> um, in the War of 1812 against Britain, that was the first time mail-in ballots happened. Most American Union soldiers in the Civil War, of which there were hundreds of thousands, voted by absentee ballot because, obviously, they weren't at home. And virtually, well, not virtually all, but most American military personnel now vote and have voted by absentee ballot for years and years and years, as with diplomats, as with foreign resident uh, American businessmen and students and people who just happen to be married to somebody who's a foreigner, they live in their spouse's country, just like Herman and me, I guess. Uh, and so absentee or mail-in balloting is not new. What is new is that many states in the West have shifted decisively to almost entirely carrying out their elections by mail-in ballots. I, I think Oregon, or is it Washington State, does all of their voting mm. by, by mail-in ballots. And the Postmaster General of the United States was recently appointed to that position by, not surprisingly, Donald Trump, with the sub rosa agenda, we believe, of trying to keep the amount and the ease and the possibility 
of mail-in balloting as low as possible on the assumption, and it's only an assumption, that mail-in ballots would preferentially be democratic ballots. But the scare tactic has been that if you have mail-in ballots, uh, the Iranians or the Chinese or the Tibetans or who knows whom uh, mm -hmm. would be able to uh, somehow rig the election with thousands or millions of votes. One of the virtues of this, this, this di diversified state-by-state -state election system is that there is no national ballot. There is no one piece of paper or one screen. There is a different ballot, sometimes within states, from district to district to district because of the, the different offices that are, that are up for, for voting. And so to counterfeit and somehow create a system of mass uh, counterfeit absentee or mail-in ballots across the country would be, uh, would be a Herculean task because you may not even know when you're printing them uh, whether you have the right information on them. And most ballots require counter signature and so forth. The chances of absentee ballots causing a major uh, counterfeit issue have been looked at by many authorities and the best they can come up with is a couple of hundred incidences of a few hundred uh, absentee ballots having been inappropriately handled. Uh, people point to a, a small city in New Jersey, Patterson, where the, where the election with absentee ballots was a shambles and that's about it. And they, they really, there isn't much other proof. Voter suppression is a slightly different issue because mm. that is pointing away from Democrats able to vote for their candidate of choice. And voter suppression is a broad category of things that includes closing down certain polling stations. It includes making the verification of you are who you say you are that much more onerous and complicated, such as looking at the excuse me, the signature on the voter roll and the signature as you come in and say, hmm, you, you crossed the T in your name differently. Are you sure you are who you say you are? Kind of yeah, thing yeah. Th thanks, Brooks. Sorry, I'm just going to, because there are lots of questions okay. coming in th through the chat. Um, and uh, just on, on that, um, somebody has asked around, I'm summarizing, uh, Russian influence again in, in this election and, and um, you know, where you see that going. I mean, we know um, everything that came out in the Mueller report and so on, but it seems to me as if, you know, as Trump um, would be quite happy with some Russian interference, perhaps. And then also um, tied to that, um, there was a question around um, how a Trump win will impact on China. Um, and same question for uh, for a Biden win, um, the Amer the US relationship um, with, with China. And then I suppose I want to add, I mean, those tariff wars that Trump sort of got into, I mean, how does that... Um, that affected some of his supporters in the heartland. And um, how might they be thinking about their vote at, at this time? Um, Herman, maybe to you first. Ah, a few, few, few light issues there to tackle. Um, <laughs> so if, if, you about, uh, <laughs> if you think about uh, Russia, uh, it is a strategic uh, foe uh, of, mm. of, the United, of the United States. Um, dating back some, some years. Uh, the interesting thing about Putin's Russia is that Putin has fundamentally changed the ranking, if you will, of Russia, um, certainly over the last decade or so. If, if you think about anything significant on the world stage that needs to be resolved, you need to engage Russia, whether it's Venezuela or it's Iran or it's Libya or it's Syria, Russia has a seat at the table. Having said that, Russia is, to all intents and purposes, their economy works on hydrocarbons and maybe selling, selling some arms. Um, and in that regard, uh, they can do well whether you know, there's chaos or, or there's peace. As a matter of fact, the more chaos there is, probably the better for Russia. Mm. I would suspect that Russia would therefore have more interest in Trump returning to the White House. China, you could make an argument that it's in their strategic interest to have Trump remain in the White House as well. Why do I say that? 
because Trump has completely upset the the apple cart. In, in some ways, you know, you you, you 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 will be at the receiving end of his decisions, whether you're friend or foe. Uh, the trade war is a classic case. It didn't start with China. It actually started um, <laughs> putting putting tariffs on 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 friendly nations. South Africa got caught up in that kind of collateral damage when he was smacking tariffs on steel and aluminium, which threatened seven thousand jobs um, here in the southern southern tip tip of Africa. He's gone after traditional NATO allies in a very aggressive way. Uh, President Macron in France, um, actually in a piece that we published late last year, was talking about um, the uncertainty around that American relationship and how Europe has to take more of its destiny into its own hands. Um, so he's alienated traditional partners that might also be aligned, for example, in confronting China because there are concerns about China which don't just reside at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Having said that, notwithstanding the incredibly partisan, divisive, poisonous environment, political environment that we're in in the United States, one of the few areas of agreement is that China has to be confronted. So whether Biden occupies uh, the White House uh, come January 20th or so of next year, or, or Trump or, or, or Pelosi or someone else, we can talk about some of the, the yeah. wild card yeah. scenarios. Yeah. China will be confronted, but the approach to do it, I think will be much more strategic, uh, much more multilateral in nature, and, and perhaps much more effective if Biden is in the White House than if Trump is in, is in the White House. Um, so, so that's one part of the argument for China, not wanting Biden there. The other part of the argument, just my last point, is that unlike Russia's kind of economic uh, well-being being based on the hydrocarbon sector and selling some arms, China is very much integrated into the world system, right? Supply chains completely integrated. Um, they, 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 their success is based on a world order that is ordered, where there are standards and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so, 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 in that regard, they don't want chaos either. And 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 Trump is is, is one who throws a number of curveballs, which which are suggesting that he's upsetting the world order, which may not work uh, in, in the medium and longer term interests of of China. So, so the jury's still out on that. But but I suspect if I was China, um, I, I might, uh, in the short term, I might want Trump to stay as opposed to a Biden. Uh, a, a Biden presidency, because I think he'll be much more strategic and much more multilateral and perhaps effective in his approach at containing mm. China. Mm. I want to um, bring you in, Brooks, because we've got a question here from Mondly Mcunu. He says, what would happen if Trump decides not to relinquish power? And here it goes back to um, the previous question around the delay between the actual election and um, counting the votes. And with the Congress and House um, with, uh, being split along bipartisan lines, how will they reign in a renegade president of the United States? Um, and so, uh, Brooks, yeah, I'm going to, to, to put that question um, to you um, because, um, yeah, this is not only a presidential um, uh, an election we're talking about, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, well, I think the first thing to, to think about is... Um, so much of what Donald Trump says is exaggeration and hyperbole for effect. Uh, so much of what he says is deliberately done to provoke, whether to encourage his, his core support or to enrage the people who dislike him, uh, the so-called Trump de uh, derangement syndrome, uh, which any number of people apparently have caught. Uh, and as a result, he has consistently deferred the answer to the question of whether he will simply accept the results of an election as an election or contest it. Now, in the 200 some odd years of presidential elections, no president has refused to leave office when his time is up and the election has been determined. There have been uh, one, two, three, four. There have been five other elections where the issue was in doubt one way or another, uh, the most recent being 2000, but the previous one, 1976, in which there were two separate sets of electoral votes sent in by a number of states, and they ultimately went to a bipartisan committee 
uh, put together by Congress to determine who won state A, state B, state C. And the vote, not surprisingly, was eight to seven on partisan lines. And the Sub Rosa agreement was that the Republicans would agree to uh, withdraw Union troops from the South at the end of the Reconstruction period after the Civil War so that the South could, could uh, in, begin to uh, take charge of its own destiny and reimpose and impose segregation and Jim Crow laws and all the rest mm. in exchange for letting uh, Rutherford B. Hayes become the president uh, in a particularly uh, undistinguished presidency of one term. Um, the Gore Ver the Gore-Bush version was decided, if you believe cynics, uh, by a 5-4 vote of the Supreme Court uh, on the disputed returns from Florida. And everybody now remembers the picture of the, uh, the, uh, the camp, the vote tabulator holding up one of those Holerith cards uh, in front of a magnifying glass. And then his, the picture shows his eyeball expanded like, uh, like a fish as he's trying to figure out whether the little piece of paper was punched through or not. So which pile does the he put cloud, so. Yeah, the hanging or the dimpled or the intact yeah. phenomena. Um, if the president refuses to uh, accept and concede, uh, it still doesn't particularly matter because the electoral votes get counted. And if there is in that unlikely event of a 269, 269 split, House of Representatives get to vote and then the Republicans' worst nightmare becomes Nancy Pelosi act <laughs> as president in accord with the Constitution. I mean, they don't want that outcome either, I suspect. Yeah, they, they don't. But Brooks, I'm getting, I, I just want to um, cut in there because we've got a question, um, and this leads on to what you're saying, um, from Linda Manessi, and she's, what is the picture um, of the House and the Senate after November 3rd? Because, sure. you know, one, one needs to, to bear that in mind. I mean, can you see um, Mitch McConnell on his way out? Well, he'll still be senator from uh, Kentucky. That seems a reasonable mm. guess, although there yeah. are some polls that say his support is weak. Mm. Yep. Uh, but there, the Democrats certainly think they have a decent shot at getting three, maybe even four new Senate seats, which, of course, would give them control of the Senate, which would then mean, since they are likely to hold control of the House mm. and theoretically Joe Biden as president, they would they would own all of the branch, all the parts of the two branches of government sufficient to pass legislation with the footnote. And we always have to say this to South African audiences, because the country is not a parliamentary system or even a mixed parliamentary system like you have in South Africa, there's no guarantee that a presidential push for a particular piece of legislation, even mm -hmm. if the even if the Congress is held by the same party, there's no absolute guarantee that it, that it would be pushed, it'd be passed into uh, into law automatically, because this, the the party has a much weaker control over the actual decisions of congressmen and senators than would be the case where you have parliamentary whips and keep in line or else you're out. Uh, yeah. Britain is the obvious example, of the yeah. most extreme of that, but so is Japan, and I think so is Germany to a considerable degree. Um, mm -hmm. If the Senate goes Democratic, then you will see certain policy changes that mean certain legal changes, which will have real effects on uh, thing, obvious things like environmental controls being brought back in, uh, certain ecological environmental standards being reimposed that had been passed through by the Obama administration. Uh, you will see a, a strong push for uh, strengthening the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare mm -hmm. uh, national mm -hmm. health plans. You'll see things like that. Uh, can I just raise one quick point? I yes, agree with quite quick, because we, yeah. yeah. Quick. Uh, in, uh, the one thing I would say is I think we should take it as a given that some part of some part of the government of Russia or its friends or some uh, easily uh, uh, some organization, you could say, well, they're not really part of the government. There will be efforts to affect uh, 
mm-hmm. voter attitudes. There may even be efforts mm-hmm. to affect uh, vote tabulations. But again, because the states control voting counts and ballots, it's much more difficult than people assume. You can't just get inside the mind of the computer that tabulates the votes. You you have to affect yep. thousands of places. Thanks, Brooks. Um, I need to come to Herman because we're running out of time here. But um, mm-hmm. just, Herman, on what this means for Africa, South Africa, um, if Biden wins, and also four more, all four more years of Trump. Right. Um, and if I could just add on a little bit to what to what Brooks has said, uh, you know, you, you have it doesn't look likely that that there's going to be a change of control in the House of Representatives. So the real contested mm-hmm. space in Congress is going to be in the Senate. And both candidates, uh, the incumbent and, and Joe Biden, will want to have the Senate, Senate under their party's control, notwithstanding the different kind of political system, as, as, as Brooks articulately outl- outlined. They're going to want to have the Senate in their, in their control. Uh, I would be particularly nervous, uh, given how the Senate effectively saved Trump's bacon when it came to the impeachment process, uh, if that went uh, Democratic and he remained at 1600 uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. And there are a few races to watch when it comes to to those Senate contests. Um, Colorado, Montana, uh, Arizona, Maine. uh, and, And that's where Republican senators are particularly at risk. And then Alabama is actually one of those seats that's in play this year is held by a Democrat and he may be at risk. So that that state may turn uh, Republican. Uh, so both seats occupied by by Republican senators. But the other ones, I think it's looking fairly precarious. And, and as um, those logged logged on may know, um, the vice president effectively uh, becomes a part of of the Senate. Um, so if it's, you know, Pence is, is, sits in the Senate, he can chair the Senate. Uh, if Kamala Harris uh, is part of the winning ticket, she would she would fall in line and, into the Senate. So if, if, if Democrats win, they only have to convert three of those seats uh, net on a net on a net basis. Uh, and if they don't, then they have to try to try to win win all four. Uh, with regards to uh, generally foreign policy, and then I'll come to come to Africa, as I as I mentioned before, uh, a, a Trump a Trump presidency is is very much an America first um, uh, America first approach. Um, hasn't been as effective with reinforcing uh, traditional relationships and and creating a, a broader front, if you will. I think uh, you'd see a very different approach, much more multilateralist, um, uh, institutionalist, with 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 the wonks and everyone else kind of uh, advising advising the approach as opposed to to policy and action by tweet. Um, uh, th- that we've seen on more than one occasion uh, in, in the Trump in the Trump administration, um, I think a- Africa will feature. Uh, it, it took a long time for Trump to fill a number of important uh, positions in the State Department and other areas. Um, I think there are a number of vacancies still when it comes to to the African uh, portfolio. Uh, we, just think about how long it took to replace the South African, uh, the U.S. ambassador to South Africa. Um, she, she's a recent appointment after uh, uh, Patrick Gaspard, Ambassador Gaspard, uh, left. So, so Africa will will feature in the discussion, and will be engaged. I think in a more uh, constructive and uh, and regular, if you will, way than what we've seen under under the, the Trump administration, who had some fairly um, interesting adjectives that he referred to uh, to, to countries uh, in this region. And, and I think he also uh, uh, he, he, he named a country which I'm still trying to identify on the map. I think it's called Nambia. Yes, uh, yes. Oh, yes. that's right. That wasn't his yeah. finest moment. But then um, no. there are many to choose from, I guess. Um, just we, we're going to have to wrap it up. And there's so many questions. And I'm really sorry not to be able to get through um, people's questions. Um, but just lastly, and Brooks, perhaps to you, just just on the the power of the debates, um, what do you think? Uh, um, how do you think these two men will square up um, on on the coming debates? Well, I think uh, two things about the debates. Uh, one, Donald Trump will be high energy, casting aspersions and insinuations uh, almost without let up. I mean, he uh, this has been his forte for years. He will spin these things off uh, almost without regard to whether or not they. They're mutually contradictory within the context of a single sentence. Joe Biden, on the other hand, will be like a much smaller, more skillful basketball team, slowing down the pace, slowing down the debate, slowing down the discussion, 
honing in on a couple of key points. Uh, I, Joe Biden, however, has not historically covered himself with glory in public debate. He's not given to being an absolutely fleet of foot uh, debater. And so his his greatest vulnerability is that. And so the, his team is going to have to train him and drill him on staying tight and crisp and focused on a couple of key points and use those words shenanigans and malarkey over and over again. Those are his, <laughs> those are his favorite words and he's going to have yes. to use them. Can I just add yeah. one thing on yes. the one? On We've got a, a, yes, important. Sure. The, the Trump administration for policy for Africa, I've, I come up with a new phrase for it. It's been benign contempt. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think by this, it means that you've really seen virtually no policy toward Africa. The mm -hmm. Biden administration, should it come to pass, uh, would revert back to some considerable degree to the kinds of things you saw the Obama administration try to achieve, which was an integration of trade, and aid and investment mm -hmm. in a mix, whether or not it's right for circumstances or the economies or even the American economy is a question. One thing is clear though, neither candidate has said very much about Africa so far in this yeah. period. We've looked pretty carefully and I, I will continue to check on that other mm -hmm. than uh, Donald Trump's earlier remarks, which we can't print in a family newspaper. Right, we've got we've got a minute left. So, um, Herman, to you, just uh, thirty seconds. What did you make of the uh, Barack Obama's intervention? Um, will that move the needle? Is it important? It struck me as as historic for a, a past president to come out against a sitting president like that. Thirty seconds. Uh, the short answer is is uh, yes. I think it will uh, move the needle. I think it underlines how serious uh he believes this election is and and what's and what's at stake um and if you believe the polling um and yes there are many uh stones you can throw at polling i mean we we, we saw how pollsters in some ways got it wrong in 2016. uh there are a lot of people who share his concern um and and this vote may not be so much about biden you know a 77 year old i think he'll be 78 if he, if he wins if he wins the election it's anyone but Trump for those who are opposed to Trump. Uh, the last point I'd make is that there is a real, I mean, there are a number of scenarios that can play out in this election. We can have a clear win for Trump. We can have a clear win mm -hmm. for Biden. We could have a tie, um, which is technically possible. Um, and that wouldn't automatically lead to uh, Pol Speaker Pelosi uh, being the acting president. It would be decided in the House of Representatives and although there are more Democratic representatives than Republican representatives, Republican representatives control more state delegations. And on the basis of that, Trump could be reelected as president of the United States. So that's just an interesting curveball I'll throw out there. Well, uh, thanks very much, Herman, for that curveball. We literally do. Brooks, do you have 10 seconds to make just the final word before I thank everyone um, for, for joining us? Um, simply to say, I've enjoyed this a lot, and I, th and yeah. I appreciate Herman's interventions and comments and observations, and I look forward to seeing more conversations with him on all of this. Um, it's It will be an exciting campaign. Uh, it's also going to be a bit of a dispiriting one in some ways, yeah, um, yeah. but uh, it will stay on at all of us. Absolutely. Um, and I suppose um, we'd like to end by thanking Brooks and Herman for a very insightful conversation. I've seen all your comments on um, in the chat, and unfortunately, we couldn't get to, to all of these questions, but people are asking for a follow-up. So um, perhaps somebody can whisper in the ear of the Daily Maverick. But um, La Maggie Funderbilt says, a tie, heaven help us. And I think that's probably all, <laughs> that's probably all of our view at this point. So um, finally, to the Daily Maverick, subscribers and to, to Brooks and Herman, thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, we'd like to thank the Conrad Adenhauer Stiftung for their generous support of this webinar. So um, 68 days to go to the election. Thank you everyone for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>